Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Earhart, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we'll be looking at Chapter 4 on checking model assumptions, in particular, checking the assumptions of normality and equal variance. So in this chapter, I'm hoping that you'll be able to assess both visually and with formal hypothesis tests assumptions of normality and equal variances. And I'll point out that we actually, I've given you more tools uh, than historically we've given students with the bootstrap to actually assess the sampling distribution of the statistic of interest, the sampling distribution of the mean or the difference in means. And that is the way I expect you uh, in my class to test the assumptions of normality. The, uh, the tests of normality in this chapter are about the, the, the normality assumption of the, or whether the distribution of the data are normal. In hypothesis testing, we don't actually care about the distribution of the data because we're counting on the central limit theorem to tell it to have the sample mean be normally distributed. So um, I'm going to uh, very briefly discuss some of the ideas in this in this chapter, but we're not going to use these ideas directly for some of our um, hypothesis tests. However, don't tune out. Uh, near the end, we're going to I'm going to point out how to test whether the means or the, whether the variances of two distributions are the same. And that is an assumption we need for our two sample tests and also in the next chapter, chapter five, for analysis of variance, for equal variances. And finally, I'm going to show you what normal data looks like and what randomness looks like to help train your intuition about when you look at a distribution, you're asking yourself, is this data normal? You'll see how widely variable normal distributions look like, or at least samples from normal distributions look like, um, so that you will be quick, or so that you won't be as quick to reject normality, because you'll see a lot of the crazy variances that you'll get just from random sampling. All right, so let me scroll on down. For testing normality, that is the normality of a distribution or population, um, we can use um, normal scores plot, basically often called QQ plots for quantile, quantile plots. That is, we're going to plot the, the quantiles of our data versus the quantiles of a known distribution, typically the normal distribution, and see whether they match up one to one. So, for example, is the, is the, you know, the fifth quantile the same between the distributions as the tenth quantile, the twentieth quantile, and so on? And if all the quantiles match up, then the shape of the distributions must be the same. And therefore, our data must be normally distributed. So let's take a look at uh, these sorts of plots. I'm going to start off by um, creating a sample of data from a normal distribution, size 150. And this data has a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15, just like IQ scores are standardized to have. And we'll just look at um, this data. Normal distribution, one thing to notice about the box plot is the box is about as wide as each of the whiskers when the data are normally distributed. Uh, otherwise, we've got, you know, sort of the bell curve, it, uh, symmetric. All right. Um, these are quantile, or QQ plots, and I'm actually going to jump ahead until um, this second plot from the car package where we have QQ capital P for plot and X1 has our normal data in it. There's some other options in here uh, which I've uh, notated what they mean in the comments above so you can read that. And the main point I want to show you here is is what this QQ plot looks like. So along the horizontal axis we have the quantiles from a truly normal distribution and along the vertical axis, we have what our data looks like. So our data is centered at 100, has a standard deviation of 15. 
and on the horizontal axis we have a normal distribution that's a standard normal distribution meaning that it has center of zero and a standard deviation of one and we're matching up along the red well not quite along the red line but um, along a diagonal line we're matching up the quantiles between these two distributions and if in fact our data are normally distributed our points will fall perfectly along this red line in practice that never happens because our data includes randomness and so we also have these red dashed lines above and below which indicate point-wise for each observation whether that point is consistent with being normal or not. And we should expect, what is it, about uh, six or eight out of a thousand points to be inside of these bounds. So if we occasionally get just one or two points outside of these bounds for a sample size of about a hundred or so, that's not so bad. And we're really worried about systematic um, patterns of these points being out of these bounds. And I'm going to show you data below where I've drawn data from different distributions where in fact we see these systematic deviances. But this, this, this data right here, all the points are inside the bounds, looks, looks normal to me. All right. So let's take a look at non-normal data. So I'm going to look at a uniform distribution, which has, um, you know, if it's uniform, every point within a range is equally likely. And notice our, our box plot, each quarter of the data has roughly the same uh, distance between those quartiles. And notice in our QQ plot, we no longer have points following the diagonal line, but we have this S shape. And S shapes are going to be differences in kurtosis. Kurtosis is how pointy your distribution is. So this distribution is very flat. And so uh, it has very low kurtosis. A kurtosis is probably close to, uh, actually probably ne a negative kurtosis. And so, nope, not a negative kurtosis. A kurtosis close to zero. Um, the kurtosis of the normal distribution is three. And so values that are lower are flatter than a normal distribution. So we end up with this S-shaped pattern. Um, here we have a heavy tail distribution. Um, I've constructed it to be very peaky in the center and then have very long tails. We, it, extreme observations are likely in, in this case. And you can see in the box plot in the bottom left how many outliers are flagged in those points beyond the whiskers. And this has an S shape, but the S is going in the other direction. And so this is, has high kurtosis. This is called leptokurtotic, whereas the flat uniform distribution above, this is called platykurtotic. That's a, a not peaky distribution, whereas the, where the normal distribution is defined as the, be, being the perfect kurtosis. We have uh, right skewed distributions. So on the left, we shows how we have a long tail to the right, and you can see sort of a U shape in the QQ plot. So that indicates right skewness, and left skewness does the exact opposite. This data is skewed to the left with a long tail to the left, and we have a, a downward shaping U in the QQ plot. So those are systematic differences in a, in a QQ plot that suggest that the data are not normal. We can also perform formal tests of normality, a hypothesis test, where the null hypothesis is that the data are normal against the alternative that the data are not normal. And um, there are dozens of these tests. To name a few, there's Shapiro-Wilkes, Kolmogorov-Smirnov, the Ryan Joyner, there's uh, Anderson-Darling, uh, AD, there's also uh, the Lilly test, there's um, the Kramer-Von-Mises test, uh, tons and tons of these tests. They all sort of test um, different characteristics of the shape of a distribution to see whether it's different from normal. I prefer to avoid the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test because it focuses too much on the center of the distribution and we often care more about the tails of the distribution uh, to the far left and the far right and for that reason um, I care more about the Anderson-Darling test, which is more sensitive to those extreme values. 
So just to show some examples of that, um, x1 was data that were normal, and if I do the Shapiro-Wilkes test for normality, there is a test statistic. Uh, so far we're familiar with the t statistic when we're doing a one sample or two sample, sample hypothesis test. Every type of statistical test will have a statistic associated with it and also a distribution that that statistic is compared against. In our case, we don't care about the statistic, we just care about the p-value. And uh, for me, I often consider a, cut, a fair cutoff for a normality dis, uh, test to be about 0.1 instead of the more strict 0.05. Uh, if it's smaller than 0.1, I'm going to be a little more concerned about the normal normality being violated, in which case I'm going to count more on the visual tests and I may use a non-parametric test as a backup. Um, I've got two more tests here, I believe. <coughs> Excuse me. The Anderson-Darling test, which is sort of the one of the tests I, I prefer more, uh, p-value of 0.3, and then the Kramer von Mises is 0.4. So all three of these tests fail to reject the, the normality assumption, which is good because this data was actually drawn from a normal distribution. Uh, keep in mind that these tests are very sensitive when you get very large sample sizes. So if you have a huge sample size, like 10,000, 20,000, even if the data are from a normal distribution, it will be very sensitive to tiny deviations from normality and is likely to reject based on that. So you want to be concerned about using these tests when you've got large sample sizes. All right, let's take a look at a few other cases. Um, so the light-tailed distribution that was our symmetric uniform distribution, uh, we end up rejecting um, normality in these cases, right? So this is 5. The E is times 10 to the negative 5. So this, this p-value actually has 0 0.00005. Uh, same thing for the heavy-tailed distribution. We were rejecting normality there. <coughs> Excuse me. And some of these uh, tests give a warning. For example, the Kramer von Mises test can't guarantee accurate computation of the p-value once the p-value gets below us a, a certain level. But believe me, you don't care. <laughs> a p-value of point, uh, nine zeros followed by a 7 is small enough for you to decide that this data are not normal. Uh, right and left skewed data are also rejecting normality. So we're getting results from our hypothesis tests that are consistent with the data. I go through an example here of testing normality for uh, the differences in sleep remedies, but we've done a, a, a better analysis of this data in the previous chapter when we used the bootstrap to assess the sampling distribution of the means of, of the, the mean difference. Um, by the way, the, the, the differences themselves are not normally distributed, and that's what we've, we saw in the previous plot, which appear, appears here. This uh, distribution looks sort of right skewed, mostly because of this one outlying observation. And we see in the QQ plot, uh, along the vertical axis is our data, and you can see how extreme this ninth observation is in in our data, but where if it was normal, it would not be very extreme. So it's it's these values that are um, suggesting difference from normality. Also, there's a small indication of sort of an S shape, which is associated with the cur high kurtosis, uh, the peaky distribution, the heavy-tailed distribution, where it's peaked in the center, and then extreme observations in both directions are are likely. And so that's that's what this five is, is suggesting to me. So we only have, what, 10 observations here, and we have three of those observations beyond the bounds. That's that's too many for to say that this data are normal. Um, we had another example of um, the andro levels in men and women, 
and if we if we test that for men on the left and women on the right, it looks like both of these are consistent with being normally distributed. The p-values are larger than 0.1, and the plots um, suggest the QQ plots on the right suggest for men and women that that they're basically normal as well. The women has one observation in the bottom left that are outside the bounds, but one in you know a dozen or or so, not too bad. All right. So the next section is about. Uh, so, okay, maybe just to summarize, most statisticians will use graphical methods. Primarily, you know, you want to graph the, the shape of the, the data, and then you want to use these QQ plots to assess normality. The formal tests, like Anderson Darling and Kramer von Mises and the like, are not tools that statisticians rely on very much. We mostly look at these QQ plots to make our decisions. All right, the next section is about what does random data look like? And so what I have done is I've, I'm going to draw s samples of size 10, and I'm going to draw 25 such samples. And OK, R is not important. Uh, and I'm going to uh, plot, uh, I'm going to draw samples from a normal distribution of size 10, and I'm going to plot 25 of those. The R here says I'm going to do five rows and five columns. That gives me the 25 samples. So I'm going to, for each sample, I'm going to create a histogram and the rug. And then I'm going to create facets for all the 25 distributions. So here, if I zoom out just a tiny bit, there's 25 samples from the same normal distribution centered at zero with a standard deviation of one. And as you look through each of these, boy, some of these do not look normal. And they look quite different from each other, right? So for example, this one in the top right looks almost uniform. Uh, the, this one on the left looks very peaky with an outlier. Okay, this number 12 here looks right skewed. And you can probably find one that's left skewed. Here's 22, looks a bit left skewed. So you can find almost any shape when you've got small sample sizes. But believe it or not, all of these samples are from a normal distribution. Let's look at a similar result, but instead of size sample size 10, we'll look at sample size 30. So I'll page on down. So we have larger samples. We should expect that the data looks more like the population because we have more information and that is the truth that is true we getting a lot more um, unimodal distributions here um, but not all of them right so even with the sample size 30 this number 23 looks left skewed um, sample 13 looks very clustered whereas um, other maybe another sample how about number five looks much more spread out uh, number six looks possibly bimodal. So it's just to give you a sense that samples of size 10, even si samples of size 30, might look different from normal, um, but are actually drawn from a normal distribution. Furthermore, um, sa duplicate samples from the same distribution can look quite different. And it's that variability that um, I want you to start to become more comfortable with in this course. All right, the second sec or the last section of this chapter I care about covering is about testing equal population variances. So this is important in, for example, the last chapter, chapter three, when we were testing uh, in a two sample scenario, whether the means were, were equal or not. We had an assumption of where we could use the pooled variance procedure when the variances were actually equal. And if they weren't, then we had to use the Satterthwaite approximation for the uh, degrees of freedom. So we have a hypothesis for testing whether means are equal. There's also a hypothesis test for testing whether variances are equal. One of them is Bartlett's test. Another is Levine's test. They do uh, the pr they are slightly different procedures, but they do a similar thing. And 
I have a description here of sort of what this is, what this calculation is doing, but I'm not going to worry too much about uh, describing it here. Instead, let's simply do a test, do this test for the andro levels between men and women. This was the example, do I have the plot here? I'm going to scroll up and find it. Here is the example. The variance for men were, was much greater than that for women. And so we're expecting to find that result when we perform this test. So the observed standard deviation for men was 42 and for women was 17. And the sample size was slightly smaller for men at 14 than women at 18. All right, I just have some uh, different summaries here. And here are three hypothesis tests for equal variances. Here's the Bartlett's test. These three methods assume different things. Bartlett's tests assume that your data are normal, but, the, but that the only difference is that their variances and their means probably are different. So if the data are normal, are the um, variances equal? So here I'm doing the level, that's the andro level, by sex, and this results in a p-value that's 0 0.0008. This is less than 0.05 or 0.1, and so this is suggesting evidence that the variances are different. The second test, the, the Levine test, does not assume normality, but still tests whether the variances are equal. And here we have, notice a p-value that's larger. So if the data are normal, we're making a stronger assumption, and so we're going to be more sensitive to differences. So we have a smaller p-value. The second test, the Levine test, is, does not assume normality. It's a little more flexible. In, in fact, it lets the center be the median instead of the mean. And we have a larger p-value, but we still reject the null hypothesis of equal variances. And the Flinger test, which is a non-parametric test, it doesn't assume anything about the shape of the distribution, but still tests whether the variances are equal. Uh, we have a, also a p-value that's quite small, 0.01. All right. My last comment here is about small sample sizes. So when you have a small sample size, you can expect extreme results. I really liked the way Daniel Kahneman uh, described this in his book Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a book that I loved. I think I read it two or three times and um, thought it was so fascinating until this, until psychology had its replication crisis that a lot of the results that are published in this book actually don't uh, replicate. So uh, unfortunately there's a lot of cool things in, that we thought were true in the world that actually are not. Nevertheless, I think his description here is is quite good about the law of small numbers, right? So as an example, um, Howard Weiner, um, I know Howard Weiner from uh, his work in data visualization, uh, and Harris Zwerling, um, he makes this observation about the incidence of kidney cancer in the 3,000 or so counties in the United States. So counties are relatively small land areas, they don't have that many people in them, and so we have small samples because kidney cancer is a fairly rare disease. So in counties in which the incidence of kidney cancer is the lowest, they are mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located traditionally in Republican states in the Midwest, South, and the West. What do you make of this? And the statistician's comment is, it's both easy and tempting to infer that the low cancer rates are due to the characteristics of these rural, sparsely populated areas, in particular clean living, rural lifestyle, no air pollution, no water pollution, fresh food, and so on. But that's, that doesn't only hold true for those um, areas with the lowest kidney cancer. Turns out, now consider the counties in which the incidence of kidney cancer is highest these ailing counties tend also to be the rural, sparsely populated, located in Republican states, Midwest, South, and West. And the point is, uh, 
it's easy to infer that the cancer, so now you can make the opposite argument. It's easy to infer now that the high cancer rate is due to poverty in rural areas, uh, no access to med medical care, high fat diets, too much alcohol, too much tobacco, and so on. So how can this possibly be true that both the these locations have both the lowest rates of kidney cancer and the highest rates? So that's the issue with small samples. The key factor is not that the counties were rural or predominantly Republican. It's that rural counties have small populations. And um, the law of large numbers says that the, as the sample size increases, that the sample statistic will converge to the population proportions. And that's, but that's with large samples. When you've got small numbers, you can have extreme results just due to sampling variability. That same sampling variability that we saw in these plots. That we have small samples and we have widely varying results. If we were to calculate these 25 sample means, uh, we would get more extreme values than if I page down for a second, than if we calculate the, sample, the distribution of sample means with size 30. We know that the sampling distribution variance depends on the op the number of observations, right? We have the S, which is this sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. And that N is is governing how much variability there can be. And so with these small samples, we have extreme results. And that actually, ar that argument actually <laughs> coincidentally leads to a lot of the replication issues in Daniel Kahneman's book where his, a lot of his psychological priming experiments don't actually replicate because they're based on small numbers. So sorry, Daniel, I respect you a lot. So that is the end of chapter four. See you for chapter five.